It's the sound of ideas from Ideastream Public Media. I'm Jenny Hamill. Thanks so much for joining us and a happy Monday to all of you. If you listen to this NPR station, chances are you're familiar with my first guest this hour. Stephen Dubner started the Freakonomics podcast over a decade ago, with its weekly episodes being heard on public radio stations across the country. He's also the author, along with Mark Levitt, of the book Freakonomics, as well as several follow-ups. Dubner, along with his co-authors and producers, use economics to explore real-world phenomena, sometimes attempt to answer unusual questions, and offer unconventional analysis. And you can bet that analysis will provide a unique blend of insight, humor, and maybe some chin-scratching. Well, tomorrow night, Dubner dissects the Freakonomics of Cleveland on stage at Playhouse Square. In addition to his speech tomorrow night, he'll be joined by Cleveland Mayor Justin Bibb for a deep dive into Cleveland's economic landscape. We're going to kick off the show today talking Freakonomics, and later in the hour, we will look at the evolving landscape of heart and lung transplant. Several area doctors will join us to discuss some recent advances in the field. But first, let me welcome Freakonomics host and author Stephen Dubner to The Sound of Ideas. Stephen, good morning. Good morning, Jenny. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for joining us. If you'd like to join the conversation, have a question or a comment for Stephen, call 866-578-0903 or 216-578-0903. You can email us at soi at ideastream.org or you can tweet us. We're at Sound of Ideas. So, Stephen, first question, and it's a simple one. How do you make economics fun? <laughs> oh, that's really easy. Um well, what we do is typically um, sort of a hybrid, I'd say, between uh, some of the tools of economics. So this goes back to the the books that I wrote with my friend Steve Levitt, who's an economist at the University of Chicago. And, you know, Levitt is an unusual economist in that he would apply the tools of an economist to topics that weren't typically the, the realm of economists. And he wasn't the first to do that. This goes back um, at least to an economist named Gary Becker, who at Chicago also studied the economics of the family, the economics of discrimination, things like this. And, mm. you know, like a lot of new things, it was thought to be heretical at first, right? Because economists should stick to the the numbers, the economy, things like that. But it turns out that one thing economists are really good at is working with large sets of data. So we've gotten a lot of insights over the, the years, over the, the decades, over the centuries, even from philosophers and psychologists and anthropologists and all, all these others. But within the social sciences, the economists, I think, are really good at working with big sets of data. And so what we try to do on Freakonomics Radio now going forward uh, for you know more than 10 years now is essentially try to find data that is truly reflective of what's going on in the world. And, you know, that may sound obvious, but it's actually not because a lot of data that we see, especially reported in the media, but reported in academia and certainly reported by politicians is very, very, very cherry picked. So we try to get the best data we can, try to analyze that data to understand the incentives that are being put in front of people because people respond to incentives and incentives are more than just financial incentives. There are moral incentives and social incentives. So if we can use data to understand incentives and we can get a little bit of a, a better beat on how human behavior really happens and how it changes, especially when you're trying to improve a, a city like Cleveland or a country like the U.S. or the world, whatever, it's really important to not kid yourself, to not fool yourself with wishful data, but to find good data. So, you know, um, weirdly, and I think I answered your question horribly because you asked, how do, how do we make it fun? The truth is um, I have an enormously fun time doing this because it's all storytelling, which is what good journalism has always been. So if, um, if I do my job well, then listeners should enjoy it as well. So let me ask you, you're you're zeroing in on Cleveland. You're going to join the mayor on stage tomorrow night. How did you use your data points and your metrics to kind of take a deeper dive into Cleveland? And did you have any specific trends or themes in mind? Well, I'm not going to pretend to be a Cleveland expert. I was sure. asked to come to Cleveland to to speak on it, and so I've I've um, I, I've I've immersed myself in the shallow end of the pool at least. Um, my probably you know so so for 15 years or so, I have been examining what makes a, a society work or city work or not work, and so 
some of the topics that I want to poke into, um, you know, I'll say probably none of these will be very surprising. Maybe one or two will be a little bit surprising, but, you know, you have to talk about economic opportunity. Um, the fact is that the data are now pretty clear that the American dream as it used to exist doesn't exist anymore, at least not mm -hmm. anywhere near the measure. And so moving to opportunity, which is the, the name of a program actually a long time ago that, um, you know, literally tried to move people from one neighborhood to another. Moving to opportunity can be really, really hard, much harder now than it used to be. I think we all know that um, empirically. We now have evidence for it. It used to be that if you were born in a low income zip code, you had a decent chance of getting into a higher income bracket by dint of hard work and, and knowledge acquisition, going to school. That has gotten much, much, much harder. So we need to talk about that. We need to talk about housing prices and opportunity. We need to talk about how that dovetails with the work from home revolution, which has produced some real gains, but also some real detriments. Um, we need to talk about, you know, I spent a, a, a long time, some years back, writing a book about, um, if you're a Cleveland Browns fan, you might want to cover your ears for a minute, but I'm a <laughs> lifelong lifelong Pittsburgh Steelers fan. And uh -oh. when I was a kid, <laughs> my childhood hero was Franco Harris. And it's a long, detailed story that I won't get into here, but suffice it to say that years later, I, I went to Pittsburgh to spend some time getting to know Franco. I was interested in the afterlife of a professional athlete. And so I spent a lot of time looking at how Pittsburgh had transitioned from mostly a, a blue collar manufacturing town to a pink and white collar services town, healthcare, education, and so on. And I see a lot of parallels there, obviously, with Cleveland. And I think, you know, you have to talk about what's what's working there and what's not working. I think one thing, you know, transportation is, some, is a, big, a big topic to talk about, especially with older cities, which are not really built for the kind of foot and bicycle and non-car traffic that invigorates a place, although I know there are some moves being made in that direction. And one thing that I was really interested to see about Cleveland is how much immigration is going on there from within the country, but especially from outside the country, and how relatively quick and easy it is to become a citizen of the U.S. when you're in Cleveland. Because, you know, if there is a consistent story in the U.S. workforce over the past 150, 200 years, it's that immigration works. And it's, of course, gotten tied up in all sorts of political posturing and arguments these last, whatever, 20, 30, 40 years. But the fact is, is that um, the U.S. Is, is starting to lose its, lose its advantage there. Canada right now is, I believe, uh, the country with the highest immigration rate, at least of any uh, well, relatively wealthy country in the world. And Canada is basically right now trying to borrow or steal the American playbook from the last hundred years. I think that's really worth keeping an eye on. Yeah. So let, let's talk about Pittsburgh. You mentioned, uh, you know, I mean, because in, in some ways there is obvious, you know, comparison to be made, um, you know, as is kind of the broader Rust Belt area. I mean, what did you see happening in Pittsburgh when you said, you know, we're, we're, this is a, a town with a history of manufacturing, and now you've got this new um, legion of white and pink collar. What is a pink collar worker anyway? And yeah, um, <laughs> what kind of talk about the dynamics at play at Pittsburgh and how that might relate to Cleveland? Sure. So pink collar is, you know, usually used to refer to as like sort sort of service jobs, anything from retail to restaurants to uh you know some of the some of the jobs in a hospital healthcare setting or education setting so you know I, I would say that some of the big things to keep in mind on the plus side and the minus side let's look at the minus side older cities have big legacy costs and it's really hard to um, save your way out of that. And so what you typically see is people who thought they had a lot coming to them in the form of pension, in the form of healthcare benefits and so on, have seen that have city have, have seen that as cities have not done a great job managing their costs overall, um, that money goes away. And that produces an unbelievable pain for all those, workers, you know, retired workers and would-be retirees who thought that they were getting a better bargain than they were. That's all the police, all the firefighters, in, in a lot of cases, teachers, transit workers, and so on. So, you know, this is basic economics. You can't spend more than you're making, but a lot of cities did what, you know, if you did it as a household, 
you'd be in an awful lot of trouble. You can't spend five times more than you're taking in and then just try to sort of whittle your way down to to get to some kind of balanced budget. So legacy costs are a huge, huge piece of this. When, when Once you're trying to wrestle with those, what do most cities do? They start to raise taxes. What happens when you raise taxes? You make everything more important, more expensive, including housing. So if you look at the places in the country that are booming right now, I mean, just take one, Dallas. Dallas is an unbelievable success story. I'm not saying everybody would want to live there necessarily, but in terms of welcoming people to live there, it's unbelievably successful due to a few very basic reasons. The taxes are generally much lower and it's generally much easier and therefore much cheaper to have a home. And um, so if if you look around the country at the places that are booming now, that are attracting residents, that are attracting jobs, that have higher levels of satisfaction, it's the Sun Belt. We know this. It's kind of from Atlanta into Dallas, into the into the Southwest and so on. So the Northeast cities, you know, the Rust Belt, you called it. I've been told not to call it the Rust Belt anymore because it's got the pejorative connotation. And I get that. But you know, we're talking about an old—that's an old classification. I yeah. know, but we're, it, you we're know, in a new era. <laughs> yeah, but it's a—you know—these are a set of problems that you can't ignore. That the headwinds are real. What I will say is what Cleveland has been doing, I think, really well. What Pittsburgh did really well is recognize that okay, these big industries that were phenomenally successful—you know, steel and coal. Let's let's say phenomenally successful at helping a lot of people make really good salaries and raise their families on that. Now, there were costs attributed to that. There were a lot of health costs and so on, which we're happy to see maybe diminish. But uh, those jobs uh, mostly went away for a variety of reasons. There's been some reshoring in American manufacturing. I know Cleveland is participating in that. But let's not, you know, get too excited about that because it's pretty small compared to what used to be. The new industries that have stepped in to fill that uh, to, to a large degree are prim- well, primarily, let's say, healthcare, healthcare services, biomedical, all in that range. And then let's call it the knowledge industries from education on into the cultural institutions. So in that regard, Cleveland is doing great. I mean, excellent universities, excellent uh, cultural institutions from orchestra to uh, to arts institutions, museums, call it the sports teams. Those are entertainment institutions. I'm sorry the uh, Guardians ended the season you know, poorly <laughs> this year. That's life. Um, and, and you, Our and, hospital and systems, which you know, we're going to have doctors coming on uh, right after you to talk about advancement in heart and lung transplant. Yeah, and you know, these are amazing stories. So the way you know, let's let's not ignore all the great news of the 21st sure. century. The way that technologies of different sorts continue to generally lift the tide is a remarkable story. Now, we humans like to complain. Um, some people get frustrated with that. I would raise my hand. It's frustrating to hear people say, oh my God, I, I can't believe I, I can't sync up my Netflix account on all 12 of my devices, right? <laughs> that's, that's a modern problem. If you look, however, at the prosperity gains over the past 100 years, of the past you know, 500 certainly, they're remarkable. That said, we do like to complain and we do like to reach for more. And I would say that is one of the best things about humans is we do engage in what uh, psychologists call habituation. And that means that we get used to our situation and we want to change it. We don't like the status. We don't like static. And so this can work in both directions. If you are in a horribly inhumane circumstance, let's say you're in a horrible prison, let's say you're in a concentration camp, you read the literature of people who've survived that, and it's unbelievable that they were able to. And you say, how do you do that? And the answer is habituation. You get used to the condition and you seek to improve it. On the other end, however, on the positive side, we also get used, we also habituate to wonderful things like all this technology that we have. I mean, we don't even think about electricity anymore. We don't even think right. about the automobile anymore. These were massive, massive, massive developments. And then we always want more. I would argue that as frustrating as that can be, it's also wonderful because, you know, a lot of different people from a lot of philosophical and religious traditions would say that the goal of humankind is to keep making it better, keep making society and civilization better, not just for ourselves, but for the next generation. So let's not get rid of, let's not, let's not throw that away. One way to do that 
is the knowledge industries are incredibly powerful that the university universities in particular i will say however for every you know plus for every benefit this is what economists teach us there is a cost so you know if you look for instance at the cost of higher education and education up and down the line it's gotten um it's spiraled the only other industry where you can see something similar is healthcare. Now, what do those two things have in common? Even though they both use a fair amount of technology, the fact is that most of the the products or most of the most of the things that they do there are kind of handmade. So in education, there's actual teaching going on by people. Technology helps but it doesn't improve the efficiency the way that, you know, an assembly line approved the efficiency of car manufacturing. And the same is true often in the healthcare field. Economists call this Baumol, Baumol's cost disease, which means that productivity does not rise to keep to keep up with the changing cost, with the with the increasing cost. And so when you've when you put your um, your, your, when you put your hopes in industries like these, healthcare and education, you also have to realize that it's very easy to let those costs spiral out of control. If you look at college tuition in the US, I think the single biggest driver of increased tuition has been the layering on of extra administration and amenities at universities. And so what you see is it costs more and more for people to go to university. Fewer people are going to university. This is getting to be a crisis level for young men. It used to be young men were much more likely going back, you know, 100 years. Yeah, plainly. I've been hearing that of recent, the, yeah. the crisis uh, facing uh, boys and young men. Um, yeah. And some of the data points that support that are really surprising. Can I interject for one second? We've got an email from Jeff, a listener, who, who uh, we're already running out of time with you, unfortunately. But an uh, email from Jeff who says that, uh, you mentioned politicians cherry pick data for their personal and party benefit. Would you ever consider doing a podcast or series that fact checks political claims on how national government policy shaped by the party in power affects the economy? Oh, Jeff, how how long do you have an 18 million <laughs> part series? I mean, truth be told, we try to do this all the time. We try to look at policy, transportation policy, housing policy. You know, I'll give you one quick example, rent stabilization and rent control. Um, it's something that politicians love to trot out. It's something that economists can barely work up the energy to laugh at anymore because economists don't like the idea of constraining a market so artificially because it has perverse incentives. It, 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 it incentivizes landlords to not invest in their buildings and it inspires people to not build new housing supply and so on. So yeah, Jeff, you're absolutely right. Um, I, I think it's a hugely important thing to do is to hold politician's feet to the fire. I can't wait to speak with your dynamic young mayor about what he's trying to do with housing, transportation, on and on, because these are incredibly important issues that we hear the headlines from the politicians. And as a, if you're a rational person who likes data, those headlines can make you uh, cringe. Stephen, we we also got a, an email from Sue from Wycliffe. Um, this is regarding traffic specifically. Since you're talking about transportation, she says, In Cleveland, since the Rapids RTA were not extended outward, someone in Euclid cannot take a job at places like the airport easily. There is only one downtown stop. Imagine New York City with only one downtown stop. So do you <laughs> have a perspective on, on kind of the minimal infrastructure needed to support kind of a thriving city when it comes to public transport or just, you know, making transportation more accessible for people? Yeah. I mean, we did an episode not long ago called something like, should all public transportation be free? And the idea is mm. that what's called fair box recovery, the amount of the transportation system budget that actually comes from paying customers. It varies a lot from city to city. Sometimes I think some of the lows can be like 30%. Some of the highs can be maybe 60%. And so one thought is, hey, wait a minute. If what you're trying to accomplish in a place is make income mobility real, what you have to do first is make opportunity mobility real. And if 
you can remove one relatively low-hanging barrier to that, which is to say not just paying for transport but having to deal with paying for it, which in a lot of places is still a pain in the neck, then, yeah, that's probably a good idea. So I'm not saying that all public transport should always be free. There are some arguments against it, but, yeah, it's a pretty good first step. The other thing is, look, these older cities like Cleveland where you are, like New York where I live, they were built for a long-ago style of living. In New York, you know, we were built for horse and carriage, not even automobiles. So one of the biggest things that happened in New York that was really lucky was building an incredibly robust subway system over 100 years ago. It was lucky because if you tried to do it now, it would be impossible. It cost trillions of dollars. So sometimes, you know, history gives you luck. Sometimes it gives you bad fortune. You have to work with what you have. But you also have to be willing to break, you know, this century's eggs to make new omelets. Lastly, Stephen, tomorrow night you'll be in conversation with Cleveland Mayor Justin Bibb. Uh, in in some respects, will you be playing a, an advisory role to the mayor when it comes to the workings of Cleveland? <laughs> <laughs> oh, Jenny, I know you don't know me well. No, so so here's the thing. Um, I love to learn, and I love to tell people what I've learned. I am not in any way an, you know, an expert, an advisor, a sure. politician. So I will share everything I have. If I hear a politician or someone else say something that I think is patently false, stupid, foolish, et cetera, I'm happy to call them on it in the kind, kindest way possible. But yeah, I don't think I'm someone, you know, I like being an honest broker and that means not having an alliance with anyone essentially. Um, and so, no, I, um, you know, once I start talking, as you've gleaned this morning, you can't shut me up. But yeah, I'm not someone you You're want to You're a host dream, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate it. All right. So we've got our honest broker, Stephen Dubner, will be speaking about the Freakonomics of Cleveland tomorrow night at 5 p.m. in the Mimi Ohio Theater in Playhouse Square. We have a link to that event on today's show page. Stephen, it's been a pleasure to talk with you this morning and uh, have fun tomorrow night. Thank you so much, Jenny. Can't wait to be there. Time now for a quick break. But on the other side, we learn about new advances made in the field of heart and lung transplant. And we look at how that has evolved. This is The Sound of Ideas. I'm Jenny Hamill. We'll be right back. At 928, you're tuned into the Sound of Ideas right here on WKSU, Ideastream Public Media, where support for today's programming comes from... Judson, providing a senior living lifestyle offering enrichment, quality health care, and programs to stay active. Information at judsonsmartliving.org or by calling 216-303-6608. P.K. Wadsworth, a family-owned heating and cooling company, serving area neighborhoods for over 85 years with their bright yellow trucks keeping families comfortable by providing system tune-ups, repairs, and equipment replacement. pkwadsworth.com. NOPEC, which is 240 Ohio communities working together to buy electricity and natural gas in bulk, helping to lower utility bills. Details at nopac.org or NOPEC's 24-7 Customer Care Center at 855-667-3201. Renewal by Anderson, a local full-service window and door replacement company in Cleveland and proud supporter of the American Cancer Society. Learn more about the campaign to help defeat cancer at RenewalByAndersonCares.com. Adding new habits is hard work, but it can pay off. From deciding to get your steps in at the local park, to tending a new garden, to mastering that backyard grill, WKSU is your companion and your trusted source for NPR news and information. And we've made it easy to listen on the go, wherever your new habits may take you. Listen live anywhere you are with the free IdeaStream public media app. Download it today. You're with the Sound of Ideas from Ideastream Public Media. I'm Jenny Hamill. Thanks so much for being with us this hour. Last week, the Cleveland Clinic made news by announcing a new model for prioritizing patients waiting for lung transplants. Now for some context, in 2022, there were over 3,000 candidates added to the National Lung Transplant wait list with over 2,700 lung transplants being performed. That according to the United Network for Organ Sharing. The study and subsequent... Quint model developed by the clinic takes the process that was in place for the old transplant waitlist system and accounts for additional factors. 
By including new factors like how long a patient has been on the wait list and the severity of their disease and how the condition progresses, doctors hope to reduce deaths among those in need of donor lungs. For the rest of the program today, we will learn about this new system from the Cleveland Clinic with some of the doctors that are involved, and we'll zoom out a bit to talk about the field of heart and lung transplant and how that has evolved broadly as well. With me now to discuss this new research and advancements are Dr. Mariam Valapur. She's the Director of Lung Transplant Outcomes at the Respiratory Institute at the Cleveland Clinic and was one of the authors of the recent study. Welcome, Dr. Valapur. Thank you for having me. And Dr. Jared Dalton is also here. He's the Director of the Lerner Research Institute Center for Populations and Health Research at the Cleveland Clinic. He's an author, also an author of the study. Dr. Dalton, welcome to you. Good morning. And on the line, we have Dr. Yasser Abu Omar. He is a cardiac surgeon and the director of heart and lung transplant at University Hospitals. Dr. Abu Omar, thank you so much for joining us. Good morning. Thank you. And if you'd like to join the conversation, have a question for our panel of experts, call 866-578-0903 or 216 216- Five seven eight zero nine zero three. You can email us at soy at ideastream.org, or you can tweet us. We are at Sound of Ideas. Okay, so Dr. Valapur, I want to start with you just to kind of remind us how organ allocation works. Now, you will see a patient who needs a lung transplant. From there, can you take me through how a patient in the current system goes from that initial determination, he or she needs a, a lung transplant, to actually getting the operation and getting a new set of lungs? Sure. The organ allocation system in the United States is a national allocation system, which means that although we see patients locally, they're listed in a national database and then and then are matched to donors that are available throughout the United States. When I see a patient in clinic, first I determine if they're sick enough to uh, require a lung transplant. And if so, we go through a workup and determine uh, when is the best time to list them. Then they go um, into a the waiting national waiting list, and from there is where we look throughout the nation for the appropriate donor for them. And then tell me about the composite allocation scores. That's something that's very familiar to you, but to our lay listeners and myself, it's a new term. Of course. Um, so the composite allocation score is a new organ allocation system for lungs in the United States, and other organ systems will follow suit. In the prior systems, geography played a big role in access to an organ. And in this new system, geography plays the least um, importance in in relation to other factors, such as biological factors and how sick someone is. And it's research that has allowed that to happen because we've gotten better at um, preservation of organs and transport of organs. Lung is the first organ to adopt that system, but other organs are working on adopting a similar system. Dr. Dalton, I know that smoking-related diseases such as COPD or other diseases such as cystic fibrosis or pulmonary fibrosis are reasons people will ultimately need a lung transplant. Can you explain how long a transplant patient usually waits on the wait list for a transplant and why might one spend a longer period of time than others? And what are the factors that contribute to that? So in the United States, there are uh, many more patients who are in need of a lung transplant than there are donors uh, available. So um, you know, pe- what the, in product of that is people end up waiting for, for transplants and, and they become very sick while waiting on the uh, organ transplant waiting list. Uh, depending on how sick patients are, their wait may be very short they may be prioritized because they're very ill and they they stand a chance to uh, have improved prognosis uh, through through a transplant, or they may be waiting for months um, or longer if if they are um, you know these are all patients with end stage lung disease so they're very sick but relatively speaking within this patient population some are um, um, more acutely ill than others and and you know those that you know the the imperative of organ allocation is to prioritize patients who are you know the sickest who who stand to benefit the most from transplant Dr. Abu Omar, as Dr. Valapur said, the comp- composite allocation score for the waitlist is new 
as of this spring. I, uh, so it's, you know, really in its infancy. W- what's your understanding of why this change has occurred? And as someone who does lung transplant, do you have a sense yet that it's better? Um I think it's early, early in the game to, to be able to decide whether it's better or not, but there's no question that it's addressed very, very important issues in patients waiting for lung transplantation. And it takes into account several factors, like Dr. Velkur has said, and that adds to that the biological factors of the patient, how urgent their medical condition, but also takes into account other factors that may prolong their wait for a transplant or for an organ, such as blood group, uh, patients, for example, at the extreme of sizes, they can wait a very prolonged time and be disadvantaged by that. And last but not least, the sensitization of the patients. Some patients, due to various biological factors, have antibodies in their body, are more likely to reject organs. That really restricts the donors that are suitable for them. So really the outcome is to prioritize the sickest patients first, but also to improve their survival and reduce the deaths on the waiting list. So it is, it is truly very promising uh, uh, in, uh, in the early phases of uh, the adoption of the composite allocation school. If you have received or been involved in the organ transplant system, we'd love to hear your experience or if you have any questions for our panels of experts, please call 866-578-0903, 216-578-0903. You can email us at soi at ideascream.org. You can tweet us. We're at Sound of Ideas. Dr. Valapur, let's get to your study. It was recently published in the American Journal of Respiratory and Critical Care Medicine. It suggests modifying the waitlist scoring system for lung transplant even further. So explain to us lay people how that would work and what you think the benefit would be. Sure. The new system, so we've already talked about the composite allocation score system. By decreasing the importance of geography, it ma- it magnifies the importance of these risk models so so that we now can move patients who are most at risk of mortality on the list or dying on the list further up on the list. Right. What the current models don't do is try to forecast what happens to our patients day to day. We update the scores when we see our patients. So it's at least every six months or more frequently when they're ill, but it's only after we see them can we update their scores. And that misses what we all know, uh, who are clinicians in the field, that patients' conditions change day to day. And what this model will do is allow us to forecast what happens to our patients on on, on, on their trajectory of their illness day to day, making it seem as if if we're with them uh, throughout their wait time. Dr. Dalton, do you want to add to that? Yeah. So, you know, as I mentioned, lungs are a scarce resource, and you know, and as, as Dr. Valpour and Dr. Abu Omar were discussing, you have these biological factors that need to be taken into account. And when a donor comes uh, uh, available, you know, there's a subset of the candidate population that is a match for for a given organ. And what the allocation really has to consider is, you know, risk, and that that is much more important. And, um, you know, there's a sort of a trade-off between, you know, balancing, you know, treatment for the, the, the sickest as well as equity for the population that has access to the um, organ. And as a part of um, making sure that it's an equitable allocation, we need to really understand the downstream consequences of a, of a decision to offer a lung to a specific candidate. So right now, the, the continuous distribution framework that you referred to, the composite allocation score, it makes a comparison of, of, of each patient's predicted mortality risk while they're waiting for a transplant and their mortality risk after they receive the organ. Um, so, you know, with the presumption that their, their risk is lower after they receive a lung transplant. Right. Um, but but that's kind of a, a static comparison. What I mean by that is that it, it it assumes that everybody's either getting the transplant today or they're not getting the transplant right. today. And the the our work was really focused on 
you know, can we provide um, um, a means for us to assess how somebody's risk may change if they're not uh, offered the organ today? Because implicitly, everybody who wasn't offered the organ, who didn't accept the organ, has to incur some sort of delay or time accrued while you have to wait for the lung. And like you said, these are the sickest of the sick. And so right. to think that they're stable and how they look today is the same that they're going to look five months from now is likely not not going to happen. Correct. And as you mentioned, some lung diseases, they have, um, they're have they relatively more stable with respect to their risk. Um, others, such as interstitial lung disease or pulmonary fibrosis, mm -hmm. where you get these nodules and, and scars in your lungs, um, they, can, they can accelerate very, very quickly. And our risk modeling really needs to take that into account. And that was the focus of our work. We were able to show that patients uh, with conditions like COPD, con uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, um, tended to be a little bit more stable in their risk. I see. And, and, and patients with uh, pulmonary fibrosis, there were uh, several that had uh, very big risk increases over time. So, Dr. Abu Omar, in, in listening to the doctors from the clinic and, and how they think, um, you know, the wait list prioritization and kind of checking in with more factors or, or maybe more frequency mm -hmm. might be beneficial for certain patients. I mean, what's your response to this? Do you think this could be helpful? Uh, first, I'd like to congratulate Dr. Dalton and Valpur on this valuable work uh, for this area that is continually evolving. And there is no doubt that this will have an impact moving forward, particularly, as mentioned, in simple terms, somebody's mortality or survival at this moment in time changes day by day. And taking this into consideration, particularly those that have been waiting the longest on the waiting list, we know these are the patients that are going to be disadvantaged ultimately with the overall transplant benefit. So incorporating this, and I'm sure the logistics of this are not going to be easy. Of course, this uh, needs to be uh, uh, incorporated on a national scale, as was mentioned earlier. Uh, but I believe this will have quite a significant income uh, Im impact on uh, to, uh, with the, the incorporating the time on the waiting list to the actual scoring and prioritizing of these patients. And congratulations uh, on completing this project. So, uh, you know, you, you wrote the study, you make these recommendations. I mean, is this something, Dr. Valapur, that the clinic will adopt? Um, that it is trying to encourage other hospital systems and other centers that do transplant to adopt to, you know, help with outcomes for people who get lung transplants uh, going forward? So I, um, I also, besides working at the clinic, I wear the hat of senior investigator for the Scientific Registry of Transplant Recipients. This is the arm of the U.S. transplant system that oversees the organ allocation system and does analysis of the system. The, as I mentioned earlier, the system is a national organ allocation right. system. So every center cannot adopt necessarily how they're going to allocate organs. When I see a patient, I list them in this national system who continues to look throughout the country for organs and makes offers to different centers. The process of policymaking in the United States is that we as uh, scientists, we will publish our work. It goes through the peer review process. Um, and then we get to talk about it with our colleagues and policymakers nationally. Um, you had mentioned UNOS earlier. This is the contractor for the policymaking arm of the US. Um, and we, you know, there's discussions to be had about if this is this is a benefit to the patient populations, and so that I, so that you know, although this paper was just published on Friday, there's already conversations about that uh, with the policymakers, and then the process begins on how do we incorporate a system that further improves survival of our patients who are waiting for transplants. So it we're, f a, you know, some time away from incorporating these changes, but I would say that the conversations have already started. Excellent. We did have a call from a listener. Um, unfortunately, it dropped out, but we, we did get the um, question. Uh, Dr. Abu Omar, I'm going to direct it to you. Uh, the listener asked, does the composite allocation score for the waiting list for an organ transplant include penalties for smoking or diabetes or other things? 
and would we call it a penalty? <laughs> Dr. Abu Omar? Uh, yeah, first of all, we don't really, um, I mean, smoking is, is, should, uh, sh the patient should uh, have a solid uh, smoking cessation program prior to being listed for transplantation in general terms. So, you know, does that, is, is there a penalty as such? No, because uh, uh, the conditions, the, the physical condition of the patient and the uh, biological markers of disease are taken into consideration and uh, impacts uh, on uh, the patient's call. But smoking and diabetes in its own right do not uh, immediately uh, provide the patient with a penalty, as it were, no. Did you want to add to that? No, um, as, as said, there is no penalty system in the medical system per se. We do require that patients abstain from behaviors that resulted in their original organ failure to begin with. And usually for smoking is at least six months of abstinence from um, smoking, proven abstinence from um, smoking before they can be even considered for an organ transplant. Which I'm sure, I mean, it sounds ridiculous to say, but it is must be incredibly hard for the patient but incredibly necessary <laughs> if you know if you want to get a new organ. It is not ridiculous. It's an addictive behavior. Yeah. This is why we don't engage in penalties in medical right. systems, right? So um, it is it's incredibly difficult. Patients mm -hmm. don't want to be sick, so but it's an addictive behavior, and sure. we work with them to abstain. That's great. Let's take a quick break, and when we return, we'll continue our conversation with some experts uh, from the Cleveland Clinic and University Hospitals talking about the latest advancements in heart and lung transplant. I'm Jenny Hamill. We'll be right back. At 948, you're tuned into The Sound of Ideas right here on WKCO Ideas Stream Public Media, where support comes from. Hey! Great Lakes Theater presents the Northeast Ohio premiere of the imaginative musical Natasha Pierre and the Great Comet of 1812 on stage at the Hannah Theater Playhouse Square through October 8th. Tickets at 216-241-6000 or greatlakestheater.org. Hey! The Cleveland Orchestra. Music director Franz Welser Most conducts Mozart Symphony No. 29, the world premiere of Johann Maria Staud's Concerto, Whereas the Reality Trembles, and Tchaikovsky's Second Symphony, October 5th through 7th, clevelandorchestra.com. How much responsibility should the nation's top military officer take for the way the war in Afghanistan ended? The outgoing chairman of the Joint Chiefs told me he stands by the advice he gave, but... People are looking for a pound of flesh. I think they're looking... I think they're looking in the wrong, wrong idea here. I'm Mary Louise Kelly, our exit interview with General Mark Milley on the next All Things Considered from NPR News. And you can join our local host, Amanda Rabinowitz, for that conversation later today at 4 right here on WKSU, Idea Stream Public Media. I'm Jenny Hamill. This is The Sound of Ideas. Thanks for staying with us this hour. If you'd like to join the conversation, please call 866-578-0903 or 216-578-0903. You can email us at soi at ideastream.org. We are continuing our conversation about advancements made in heart and lung transplant. I'm being joined by Dr. Jared Dalton, Director of Learner Research Institute Center for Populations and Health Research at the Cleveland Clinic, Dr. Miriam Valapur, Director of Lung Transplant Outcomes at the Respiratory Institute at the Cleveland Clinic, and Dr. Yasser Abu Omar, who is a cardiac surgeon and leads heart and lung transplant at University Hospitals. Dr. Abu Omar, much more recently, technologies have been developed that allow you to transplant hearts from what we call non-brain dead donors or DCD. Okay, so break this down for, again, the lay people out there. Can you explain how that has significantly changed the field of heart transplant? Of course. Um, so first of all, uh, transplantation in this day and age uh, and has always been limited by donor organ availability. Now, anything that we can do to expand that donor pool will directly translate into benefit for our patients who are waiting for transplantation. The patients waiting for transplantation exceeds the number of donors that we have available. And thus, any resource where we can increase or enlarge the donor pool will be beneficial for our patients. DCD is one of those. 
And what DCD stands for is donation of the circulatory death. This is different from the standard uh, heart beating donation. This is a non heart beating donation. The heart beating donation, usually patients are diagnosed with brain death and they become donors. And this is very controlled because the organs are being perfused, supplied with blood, and the heart continues to beat. And it's a very controlled situation. Non-heart beating donors or donation of the circulatory death, DCD, which what we'll hear about increasingly in the coming months and years, are patients who have sustained such severe brain injury that the chance of recovery is minimal. These are the patients that are usually transitioned to comfort care in intensive care units. We've used organs from these donors over the years, and we used lungs and livers and kidneys from them. But the, using the heart has eluded us, and the reason being is that if the definition of death is the, the fact that the heart has to be stopped for a number of minutes, then how are we going to use this heart into a recipient that is in desperate need of that organ? But with technology and advancement, and we led a group in Cambridge in the UK where we uh, led DCD heart transplantation and had the largest series in the world at the time of uh, building uh, a perfusion system. By that I mean these hearts, we can actually recover them while they're stopped hmm. and install them on a rig as it were, where they can be provided with blood and they can be reanimated and start beating again allows us the time to assess these hearts and if they prove to be good then they're used for transplantation so this is uh, in simple terms how these hearts from dcd donors can be utilized uh, for transplantation so you've used a couple of terms that, that interest me you're talking about reanimating a heart that is no longer beating yes so what that means is that I mean, that sounds pretty fascinating. <laughs> no, of course. Uh, I mean, this is uh, the heart has stopped. And usually there's a standoff period of five minutes before the death of the donor is confirmed. And then procurement of the organs proceeds. The heart at this stage is completely arrested. It's stopped. This is the definition of death. It's a non-heart beating donor. Now, these hearts, if you provide them with blood and oxygen and the appropriate supply of nutrients, then the heart can start beating again. And we have proven that the heart can regain normal function. Of course, the longer the heart is arrested, the less is the chance that it will recover right. total normality. So time so still is of the essence. Absolutely. So this is something that my understanding you're doing at university hospitals currently, and I, I believe as well, the clinic is doing as well. That's right. There's about uh, 20 or so centers in the country uh, utilizing uh, these donors and many more, of course, internationally. Back in 2015, 2016, there were only initially two centers in the world that were doing it, and that was in Sydney and in Cambridge, where I was. Uh, but this has been disseminated after the evidence that has uh, become available, particularly from our colleagues uh, uh, in the United States, uh, led by the group at Duke, that demonstrated that using these hearts is actually as good as using the hearts from the standard uh, uh, DVD or heart beating donors. And do you think that the use of these hearts and then ultimately maybe other lungs donation after circulatory death will add to the um, possibility or, or add to the number of hearts available to those waiting on the list? Absolutely no question about it. We've demonstrated that this adds 20 to 30 percent more donor organs as far as the heart is concerned for patients waiting for heart transplantation. So there's no doubt that there's a projected, I would say, 30% increase of donor organ availability using this new method. We have an email from listener Dan. Can you donate one lung? Is that helpful? Can lifelong smokers donate their lungs, be organ donors? Um, I'm going to uh, direct this to uh, Dr. Valapur. 
You absolutely can. So you can wow. have... Um, so we don't do living donor lung donation anymore ever since... 2006, that that practice has gone away mostly because we went into an acuity system where, where patients who were at risk of dying on the list, we immediately we could access national the national organ uh, transplant system for them. However, you can easily donate uh, a lo- uh, deceased donors. We can uh, take one or two lungs depending on the condition of mm. the lungs, and. Uh, and yes, we do take donors um, from uh, previous smokers. Now, there is usually a cutoff of about 20 years. We evaluate the organs to make sure they're, they can oxygenate well and they're free of disease, obviously, before we take them. Uh, but yes, to that, both. That, yeah, that's a fascinating, fascinating question and the answer. We have an email from Matt who wrote in and asked, how long will someone who was at the top of the list have to wait for a transplant? So the national statistic is that 50% of the population on the list gets transplanted within three months. So it's pretty quick. If you're on the very top of the list, if you don't have any biological conditions that make it difficult for you to find an organ, patients can get transplanted within 24 hours. It's happened to me. I've listed someone before they could even go home, they got an offer. So it, it depends on degree of illness. If somebody's very ill and they don't have any biological impediments for being matched that we've already discussed, uh, they can get transplanted very quickly. And now that we're in this new composite allocation score system, remember we don't have any really geographic limitations, so we can get organ offers from anywhere in the country. Okay, my final question, we've run out of time. This is all incumbent on people donating their organs. I mean, A, is there a way to speak to our public about the help needed and the necessity of people to being willing to give up those organs, you know, once, I guess, once they've passed or, you know, in that, you know, having the ability to donate? Is that something that that is of, of, of dire need? I would say these concepts seem abstract when you are not sick and in need of an organ. But um, when you, when I see my patients who are desperately awaiting with their families for an organ, it becomes real, um, and there is a dire need. We have patients dying on the list every day. Dr. Miriam Valapour uh, with the Cleveland Clinic, thank you so much for being here. My pleasure. Dr. Jared Dalton with the Cleveland Clinic, thanks so much. Thank you. And Dr. Yasser Abu Omar with University Hospitals, thanks so much for joining us as well. My pleasure. To get the last word on today's topic, send an email to soi at ideastream.org. We're on Twitter at Sound of Ideas, and you can follow me at Jenny Hamill underscore. Tomorrow on the Sound of Ideas, we'll talk about University Hospital's decision to close their family medicine residency program. Plus, we learn about one woman's literacy in the hood campaign. If you missed any portion of this program, find us online or listen to the Sound of Ideas podcast. You can also hear a rebroadcast tonight at 9 on 89.7 WKSU. I'm Jenny Hamill. Thanks so much for listening. We'll speak to you again tomorrow. You're listening to 89.7 WKSU Kent, a public media service licensed to Kent State University and operated by IdeaStream Public Media. (laughs) 